Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save in 2024. Wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you purchase a three month plan. To get this new customer offer, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. It was yet another sleepy weekend at the box office. This January has been the worst, but we still have some stuff that we're going to talk about, including the return of Godzilla Minus One to the top 10, thanks to its Godzilla Minus One Minus Color reissue. It also puts it into some of the record books as far as international films here in the US and in Canada. And of course, I'm also going to take your questions on the Mint Mobile hotline and a lot of other fun stuff. So let's start with looking at the top 10 for this past weekend, and it was actually reported in the early industry estimates that the Beekeeper had overtaken Mean Girls for the number one slot, but when actuals came in, and this is one reason why I wait for actual numbers, Mean Girls actually retains its spot at number one. Sometimes his estimates are just a little too high. A 40.8% drop for a $6.9 million total. Its domestic total is now topped $60 million. The Beekeeper, though, had a strong hold. It dropped just 22.4% in week three, for a total of $6,679,000, so about $200,000 and change behind Mean Girls. Its domestic total is now over $41.5 million. Wonka stays in third place, dropping just 15.7% for a total around $5.6 million. Its domestic total now approaching $200 million. Migration drops just 10% from last weekend for a total just under $5 million and a domestic total over $100 million. It's had very very good legs, or I guess wings, since it's opening right around Christmas. And then Anyone But You, also holding well, it drops just 14.4% for a total around $4.6 million. Its domestic total now, $71 million, and it's still going strong as we enter the February 14th Valentine's Day season. Could we see Anyone But You creep and crawl up to that $100 million domestic mark? That would be a great story, and I'll keep an eye on it. A couple of notes on some of the top five films, and I want to talk for First of all, about Wonka. I kind of biffed this chart a couple weeks ago because I meant in my head to say the top musicals of the 2020s, and I think I said the 21st century. It was a whole big mess, but Wonka has done well enough to say that it is now one of the best performing live action musicals of the 21st century. So let's give you that actual chart. These are live action musicals, not animated, and I'm also excluding Disney live action remakes because I think that the draw is more the Disney element than the musical element. And by these numbers, Wonka is actually the highest grossing non-Disney live action musical of the 21st century at $194.9 million, followed by The Greatest Showman at $174.3 million. Mary Poppins Returns, it's crazy. Nobody ever talks about this movie, but it made $171.9 million about five years ago. The Best Picture winner, Chicago, is at number four at $170.6 million, and then La La Land at $151.1 million. But you know what we do here on the show because we're covering a couple of decades decades of numbers. We're going to go ahead and adjust those for inflation. And when we do that, Chicago takes the top spot at an adjusted gross of $289 million, followed by The Greatest Showman at $216.7 million. Then Mary Poppins returns at $208.6 million. Mamma Mia at $204.5 million. And Les Miserables at $197.4 million. So Wonka will probably break into this inflation adjusted chart very soon, but it's not there quite yet. Looking at the highest gross live action musicals this century worldwide, again, excluding Disney remakes. Mamma Mia is at number one at over $600 million back in 2008. That is impressive. Wonka is actually at number two at $531.7 million, followed by La La Land. Most people don't know that that was a big global hit. $446 million ahead of Les Miserables at $441.8 million and The Greatest Showman at $434.9 million. Also to check in quickly on Migration, which is still the lowest grossing Illumination film domestically, but it is slowly creeping up on Hop to take that spot unadjusted for inflation. So it looks like it will be able to barely avoid being the lowest grossing Illumination film domestically and worldwide. Let's turn now to the rest of the top 10 this past weekend. At number six is the Indian fighter jet movie, well, Fighter at $3.74 million for the weekend. Poor Things had a big expansion leading out of its big 
week with the Oscar nominations. It increased business 36.6% for a $2.9 million total. Its domestic gross is now approaching $25 million. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom hangs around the top 10 for another week, a 25% drop from last weekend and a $2.7 million total. And then we have Godzilla minus one, a 290% increase in business and a $2.7 million total. It almost actually overtook Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom for number eight on the chart. The reason why it had such a big expansion and such an increase in the top 10 is that they did do the Godzilla minus one minus color special edition, special reissue. But allegedly the movie will be leaving theaters this week. So if you haven't seen Godzilla minus one yet, then you are probably gonna wanna do so here in the next few days because its theatrical run is supposedly coming to an end, although they extend these things all the time. If you look at that domestic total, that puts Godzilla minus one at $55.1 million, which is significant because it has now moved past Parasite and Hero on the all-time international film grosses domestically for live action films. This is not including animation like the Pokemon movies and Demon Slayer, etc. But as far as live action goes, Godzilla minus one, now the third highest grossing international film of all time here in the United States and Canada. And it's very close. We'll see what kind of business it can do here in the next few days to overtaking life is beautiful for second place on this list. And again, what I love about this movie and about Godzilla Minus One and its achievement here is that when you look at those other ones, uh, not all of them, Hero is more action oriented, but Parasite, Life is Beautiful, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, those are all sort of more awardsy films. Whereas Godzilla Minus One is a pure genre movie, I never would have predicted that a Japanese language Godzilla film would break the $50 million barrier here domestically. I mean, worldwide for some of those films, that's a great gross. And it just goes to show you that this movie really is speaking to people and transcending a level beyond just the usual Godzilla film. Because, you know, if it had been a flash in the pan, then we would have seen a big opening weekend and then a big drop off. But the fact that it stuck around for so long, they put it back out in theaters and a significant number of people went back to either see it again or see it for the first time. Of course, getting the Oscar nomination for its visual effects is a big boost to the film. This is really one of those movies that has a following for something other than the fact that it has Godzilla in it. You can tell that this is a movie that's connecting to people on a story level, on a human level, and that's why I like talking about it, and that's why I've liked tracking it here on the channel. Uh, it really does feel special in a way that a lot of other movies don't feel special, and I know it hasn't made $500 million or even $100 million here domestically, but everything about this show and about the movies and everything we talk about here is scale. What is the impact it's having on the audience that it's finding, and what are the resources that the movie had? And this movie had a fraction of the resources that a usual film that comes out here uh, domestically has, and it really is word of mouth and return business and connection to the film that's driven so much of the business for Godzilla Minus One. So it's a great closing chapter as it enters the five highest grossing international films domestically of all time here, and uh, this has been a really fun movie to cover and something that I've enjoyed tracking week to week. Quickly rounding out the top 10, American Fiction comes in 10th place. It had a 48% boost in business as it also increased based on its several Oscar nominations nominations for a $2.597 million weekend. Its domestic total is now at around $11.5 million. Dropping out of the top 10 this week are The Boys in the Boat after four weeks, Night Swim after three weeks, and then ISS, which really did not make much of an impact at all. It's out of the top 10 after just one week. Looking at the movies that lost the most theaters this past weekend, The Book of Clarence really just plummets out of theaters. 1,341 theaters dropped The Book of Clarence. It is now out of wide release. It's now in only 669 theaters around the country, just not a movie that was able to find its audience theatrically. The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, actually loses a big chunk of theaters. I think it had a small expansion uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, but it dropped 671 theaters. It is now out of wide release. It's only in 444 theaters around the country. Night Swim drops out of 440 theaters. It's now in 2,268 theaters. Freud's Last Session, it was a limited release that still dropped about two thirds of its theaters, 405 theaters lost. It's now in 229 nationwide. And then the Iron Claw has also fallen out of wide release. It loses 395 theaters. It remains in 926 theaters. This is a chart that I like to call our road to recovery. The blue line is the weekend average for 2015 through 2019. The red line, the weekend average for 2021 to 2023. And the dotted black line is where we were this past weekend. And as you can see, we 
are still very much closer to where we have been than where we were. The only thing that's really great, I guess, is that we're not dipping below the average box office since theaters started reopening, although on a weekend-by-weekend -weekend basis, we are below some of them. The highest performing film for 2021 through 2023 was last year and the continued performance of Avatar The Way of Water. The highest performing film for 2015 through 2019 was American Sniper, which continued its wide run as it also headed towards the Academy Awards. Turning outside the domestic box office to the international picture, Fighter was the number one film, largely driven by a debut in India at $20.8 million, followed by Anyone But You at $14.2 million as it expands its worldwide release. China's Johnny Keep Walking stays in the top five at $12.3 million, followed by The Beekeeper at $10.9 million, and Poor Things at $10 million. When we take those international grosses, we combine them with our domestic grosses, we get our top five films worldwide, and Fighter is the number one film in the world at $24.5 million, followed by Anyone But You, which has an 18.7% increase in business at $18.8 million. Again, it continues to increase its release worldwide as we get further into 2024. The Beekeeper loses 19.7% from last weekend for a $17.5 million total in third place. Wonka loses 20.8% from last weekend for $13.4 million in fourth place. And then Poor Things, as it expands and opens in other markets, adds 38.3% business from last weekend for a $12.9 million worldwide weekend total. So that's a look at the top movies this weekend and around the world. We have a lot more weekend charts to look at, but before we do, I want to take some calls here from the Mint Mobile hotline. It's been a great addition to the show, and we have some really fun questions this week. Our first question is from Audrey in Puerto Rico. Hey, Dan, this is Audrey from Puerto Rico. There's sort of this like, general convention that fall releases are favorite to be contenders for the Oscars, and I'm curious if that's statistically true. Just thinking last year, everywhere, all at once, the spring release, Oppenheimer this year's summer. So is there really a statistic advantage to being released in the fall? Um, thank you for all your hard work and for being kind of the voice of reason on the internet. I'm a huge fan of yours, and I'm excited to maybe hear some of the answers. Thanks so much for that question, Audrey. And you know, I always love to get a question that lets me crack my knuckles and start crunching some numbers. It is definitely accepted in Hollywood that award season really is the last three months of the year, from October through December, because that's when the Toronto International Film Festival and a lot of the other quote-unquote prestige film festivals are. And that's when so many studios put out their awards movies. That's when they start sending everything to critics, because that's when critics put their lists together. But you're also right. Everything Everywhere All at Once spent a whole year in theaters before it won Best Picture last year, and that's happened in the case of a couple of other movies. So is it a statistical advantage to release in the last, let's say, three months of the year? Well, I looked at the last 10 years of Oscar movies because we want to look at more recent trends. And when we look at those numbers from January through March, which would be the first three months of the year, there were six Best Picture nominees released, but two winners, Nomadland and Everything Everywhere All at Once. Although it must be noted that Nomadland really was only a first quarter release because of COVID delays and because they pushed the eligibility window a little bit later than it normally was. But... It's still in the first quarter of the year. It has an asterisk, but it's still there. In the second quarter of the year, April through June, only four nominees in the past 10 years were released with zero winners. In the July through September window, eight Best Picture nominees were released with one winner, which was CODA. And then in the October through December window, the last three months of the year, 89 Best Picture nominees were released with six winners, including Birdman, Spotlight, Moonlight, The Shape of Water, Green Book, and Parasite. So looking at the numbers, 79.8% of all Best Picture nominees for the last 10 Oscar ceremony, including this year's, were released between October and December. However, there has not been a fall or holiday release that has won the Academy Award since Parasite. So we had Nomadland, which was released early in the year. Yes, for COVID reasons, but still released early in the year. We had Coda, which was released in August. We had Everything Everywhere All at Once. And then, of course, the Best Picture winner is pending. But should Oppenheimer win this year, as it's expected to do, then that would mean that in the 2020s, or at least for film year 2020 through 2023, there has not been a film that is released in that last three months of the year that's actually won 
Best Picture. Now, I don't think that that means that studios are going to start releasing award season movies in different seasons, but it is kind of an interesting confluence of events that we've had a run of non-fall releases winning Best Picture that looks to extend to four years running. So, Audrey, to answer your question, yes, we have had some Best Picture winners that were not released in the last three months of the year. However, statistically, you have a distinct advantage to be nominated when you are put out during quote-unquote award season because four out of five Best Picture nominees for the last 10 years have been released in that window. Our next question is from Caden in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, Dan, this is Caden from Salt Lake City, Utah. And I was just wondering what it's like to get screeners from studios for films that are getting ready for awards season. From my understanding, it, they're usually DVDs and they have a watermark. How does that impact your experience viewing the film? I know I personally prefer to watch my movies on the biggest screen possible in the highest resolution possible, so I would at least expect screeners to be Blu-ray discs rather than DVDs with a watermark. So yeah, just let me know your thoughts on what exactly it's like to receive a screener and how that may influence your perception of a movie. Thanks so much. Hey, Caden, thanks for that call from Utah where they just wrapped up the Sundance Film Festival and stay tuned right here on the channel. I've got a video coming out, I think, tomorrow recapping my experience and my favorites from Sundance. Now, Sundance actually has a great screening system where you can watch it at home uh, through, I watch it on Apple TV, and it's not watermarked or anything like that, but you are right. For the things that studios send out, there are usually watermarks on the award season for your consideration movies, and that's to prevent piracy so that nobody just rips it to the internet. Those watermarks can be traced, some of them, back to the individual person, or they at least identify that this is a not-for-public-use copy of the film. The other thing that's true is that when studios send physical copies of movies, like, for example, this one of American Fiction, they are usually on DVD, uh, and that's because I think they wanna make sure that everybody can play the disc in their homes. Maybe not everybody has a Blu-ray player. Uh, some films I have had sent to me on Blu-ray, and those are usually movies uh, from directors who really want you to see their films in HD. I think Dune was sent on Blu-ray. I want to say Tenet was sent on Blu-ray. Uh, not surprising that those directors would want their films sent on a high-definition format. But yes, the majority of physical copies are sent on DVD. The picture quality is not terrible. It's as good as a standard-definition DVD picture could get, but it's not ideal. It's not optimal. And listen, if I could, I would love to see every awards season movie in theaters. But even when I lived in Los Angeles, that would be difficult. There are numerous screenings in Los Angeles and New York and some of the bigger cities for awards season. But where I am and where a lot of critics are, there are no screenings. And so if you want to watch these movies, you're watching them at home or you're not watching them at all. And I want to see the films because I want to be able to see the ones that I think are the best. I want to give those films exposure and vote for them in various different critics awards. So you do have to compromise a bit, or at least I do, as far as how I want to see a film. But the quality of the DVD itself uh, and the watermark on the DVD, which is not there the entire time, has never really bothered me or taken me out of the film. Uh, most studios now also provide some sort of a digital viewing option, which you can get in HD. And again, there are watermarks, but they're not everywhere on the picture. The thing that I found is that if a movie's good enough, it doesn't really matter how I watch it as far as award season consideration. A Tar, for example, I saw at home. I was not able to see that in a theater. And it was my favorite movie of last year, or I should say of 2022. Uh, and so I think that a great movie sort of transcends format, although I would like to have seen them all uh, in the theater. And the watermark question really has never applied to anything except for uh, not award screeners, but advanced stuff, uh, review links, etc. from one particular particular studio, and I won't say which studio it is, but it's a big studio. And they, it's, it's not quite as bad as it used to be, but they would send, if you watched it online uh, ahead of time, your entire email address would be right in the center of the screen at like 20% opacity. And so it would always take me about five minutes to sort of like see through my own email address. It was sort of like learning how to see the matrix. You just had to like kind of look through the, the code and like see the actual picture. Uh, so that was, that's actually been the only time that any sort of a watermark has made it difficult for me to watch a movie. But yeah, I generally found that great films are great no matter how you see them. At the same time, I still think the optimal way to see a lot of them is in theaters. Our last question comes from Craig in Michigan. Hi, Dan. This is Craig from Frankfurt, Michigan. Longtime fan. My question is, 
regarding the number of theaters that a movie gets released in. Please help me understand this. Because why wouldn't all studios say, we want our movie released into 4,000 theaters every single time? What determines the number of theaters that big movies get released in, mid-tier movies get released in? Anyway, thanks, and I love Charles with Dan. Always look forward to it on Tuesday. That's a great question, Craig, and really the answer to it is it depends as far as the strategy behind why movies go into certain theaters and how they're booked. When you're talking about the big change, your Regals, your AMCs, your Cinemarks, there are certain movies that you know they're going to take. They do things like CinemaCon where they have the theater owners show up and they get everybody excited about whatever the big movie is going to be, but AMC and Regal Cinemark, they, they're going to book The Flash. There's not there's not a reality where they're not going to book The Flash or they're not going to book, uh, you know, Avatar or some of the big blockbuster films. Now, when you talk about smaller independent chains or smaller theaters themselves that operate on their own, then most of them work through either themselves or some sort of a representative or a booking agent who talks to the studios. They kind of say, okay, I want to show this movie. The agent or the rep goes to the studio. They come up with terms. They come back to the theater owner and they decide, okay, we're going to book this movie or okay, we're not going to book this movie. Some independent theaters want to book larger films. Some independent theaters don't care about that. They'll cede that market share to the big chains and they'll take the smaller movies. But with every movie, I think it is a combination of the theater strategy and the studio strategy. And to answer your first question or the first part, which was why don't studios just put movies in 4,000 theaters all the time? Well, first of all, every movie has a different amount of resources. So a small indie film doesn't have the marketing budget that you know a big blockbuster superhero or comic book action movie does. So to throw, for example, American fiction into 4,000 theaters all around the country without the marketing budget to tell people that it's playing and to sell the movie to people, well, that's sort of a waste. And I think a lot of theater owners would be reticent to do that because they'd say, well, okay, I'm going to book you in this auditorium, but if you can't sell the movie or promote it, then nobody's going to come see it and I'm losing out on something that maybe I could book that would bring me a lot more money. And it could be that a studio wants to do that thing where they put a movie in, you know, six theaters in two cities, LA and New York for a weekend and get the buzz going and get featured on shows like this because I'll say like it had $150,000 per theater average and slowly they choose to expand it because they want word of mouth to spread. That helps when you don't have a great marketing budget. If you get word of mouth to build now social media buzz to build. And so it's not just one strategy. It's a combination of strategies on the side of the studio, on the side of the theaters. And I think that they're tailored to each individual film's needs. A big $150 million blockbuster needs to get into 4,000 theaters right away because it's got to start making money and you want that big splashy opening weekend and you want as many people as possible to see it right away. A $5 million indie maybe has a $15 million marketing budget. They need to expand slowly and as people see it and like it and start talking about it, it can expand, it can get into more theaters, maybe get a little bit more marketing money. I think that it's not quite as easy as a lot of people give it credit for when it comes to film marketing. And so I understand the question behind that strategy, well, why not just do everything this way? But the reality is that it has to really be tailored much more than many would expect. Thanks to everybody who called into the Mint Mobile hotline. And if you want to ask your question, you can call at plus one three two three eight six three thirty three eleven. I'd love to hear your question. It may get answered here on the show. And of course, I want to thank the people that make the Mint Mobile hotline possible, Mint Mobile. This is the week that we celebrate Groundhog Day, the inspiration behind one of my favorite movies, and sometimes it seems like you're stuck in Groundhog Day with your wireless bill, the same overpriced plans and hidden fees over and over again. Well, Mint Mobile is here to break you out of that cycle because right now, all wireless plans are now $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan that's unlimited talk, text, and data for 15 bucks a month. Bing! Unlike Phil Connors, we can't spend cash like there's no tomorrow, and every dollar counts. So switching to Mint will put your money back in your pocket so you can do things like take piano lessons or enroll in that French poetry class you've been thinking about. At Mint, all plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can also use your own phone with any Mint mobile plan and bring your own phone number along with all of your existing contacts. But unlike Phil Connors' Groundhog Day, this offer won't last for 
forever. So ditch that overpriced contract today and switch to Mint. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle. That's mintmobile.com slash Merle. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Merle. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, let's take a look at some more of these weekend charts, and we'll look, first of all, at the per theater averages for January 26th through the 28th, a lot of these limited releases that I was just talking about. At number one is Sometimes I Think About Dying, which I'm happy to see because I really enjoyed watching this movie this time last year uh, when it played at Sundance. It was playing in just two theaters, but it had the highest per theater average of the weekend at $20,230. I doubt that this will expand very wide, but if it's playing near you, I do recommend it. In second place, is The Peasants playing in just one theater at $13,709 in that theater. This is an animated film from Poland done in the style of the filmmaker's previous film, Loving Vincent. In third place is Totem at $10,360 playing in one theater. This was Mexico's submission to the Academy Awards, which made the shortlist for Best International Film, but wasn't nominated. In fourth place is The Sweet East at $7,510 playing in three theaters. This actually hit the limited release chart back in December of last year, but with a cast that includes Io Debris and Jacob Elordi, I'm sure that it is still securing releases and special screenings. And then in fifth place, playing in 662 theaters, is Fighter from India at $5,656. Because of the lack of wide releases, no surprise here that all of the films on the per theater chart this week are in limited release. Speaking of limited release, these were the top performing films playing in 1,000 theaters or fewer. At number one is Fighter, which made $3.74 million in 662 theaters. Origin spread to 664 theaters for a total right around $1.3 million. The Zone of Interest expanded to 317 theaters and brought in a gross of over a million dollars for the weekend. All of Us Strangers, which I think should have been nominated for more Oscars than it was, was in 255 theaters this past weekend and grossed around $422,000. And then in fifth place, this really surprised me, Miller's Girl, which played in just 350 theaters, still didn't really do well in limited release, just $321,000. You had Martin Freeman, you had Jenna Ortega, but it looks like the studio just sent this movie out to die. There was no promotion, it didn't get anything close to a wide release. It looks like they just wanted to dump this movie and forget about it, and that seems to be largely what happened. These are the top performers in limited release this year. These are all tickets sold as of January 1st. American Fiction has the top spot at $8.9 million, but it freezes because it is now in wide release, so I have frozen that gross. That is its gross only for the days that it played in fewer than 1,000 theaters. Poor Things moves down to second. It made $8 million this year in limited release before expanding to wide release. A lot of these Indian films, I've had to kind of figure out what the grosses are just from different reports that I could find. It's always complicated to try to find consistent reporting. I've got Hanuman in third place at $5 million, followed by Fighter at $4.3 million. Then we have All of Us Strangers at $2.7 million. It moves up into the top five. Good Hunter Karam drops three spots to number six at $2.6 million. The Zone of Interest close behind at number seven. Then we have Origin in eighth place. Queen Rock Montreal drops four spots to number nine. And Freud's Last Session drops one spot to number 10. Dropping out of the top 10 altogether is Salar Part 1, Ceasefire. Of course, those independent films and many others can be found at the independent theaters that are scattered around the country and around the world. And I like to take a moment often here on the show to recognize one in particular. And this week, we're going to go to Billings, Montana to check out the Art House Cinema and Pub renovated from an old bowling alley. The Art House opened its doors in March 2015 to bring independent cinema to downtown Billings. It has now been upgraded to three screens, which offer a combination of current indie movies and also old Older titles. Right now at the Art House Cinema, you can find American Fiction, All of Us Strangers, Origin, and Freud's Last Session. And this week, they're also offering screenings of Drop Dead Gorgeous, Robert Altman's Popeye, Groundhog Day, and Do the Right Thing at their affiliated theater, The Babcock, which is located just around the corner from the Art House. There's also a restaurant inside the Art House called Reels for all of your in and out of theater dining. And you can learn more about the Art House at arthousebillings.com. They are a 501c3 
organization, meaning that all donations made to them are tax deductible. They're just $15,000 short of their $300,000 goal to fund their phase two expansion, which is what brought the restaurant and multiple theaters to the Art House Cinema. And if you live nearby, they also offer membership. So if you donate to the Art House in Billings, Montana, or you stop by to see a movie, as always, tell them Dan sent you. Let's take a look at some of the yearly charts, and we'll actually start with an update to the 2023 fall holiday box office. So these are movies released in the last three months of 2023. Killers of the Flower Moon is now off of that top 10, as Anyone But You becomes one of the 10 highest grossing films of the last quarter of last year. All the other movies stay the same, with Wonka now at the top, approaching $200 million. And we'll see how high Anyone But You can climb up this chart. Looking at the 2024 annual box office, these are movies released in 2024. Mean Girls remains number one at $60.4 million, followed by The Beekeeper at $41.5 million. Night Swim is in second place at $26.7 million, followed by The Book of Clarence and ISS, very close together, those two films. Hanu Man is at number six, followed by Fighter at number seven. Gunter Karam drops two spots to number eight. Queen Rock Montreal drops one spot to number nine. And there's one spot that's yet to be filled. I only put movies with over a $1 million gross on this chart there will be a full top 10 on next week's show looking at all tickets sold since january 1st for probably one more week wonka is the top selling movie of the year so far the calendar year but mean girls should take over that spot next week migration is in third place followed by anyone but you in fourth place the beekeeper moves up one spot to fifth aquaman and the lost kingdom drops down one spot to sixth then we have night swim the boys in the boat the iron claw and the color purple. And finally, looking at the 2024 worldwide box office, or as close as I can get it, there are so many different sources with so many different pieces of information. The Beekeeper becomes the first movie of 2024 to break $100 million worldwide. It is the top grossing movie of the year, followed by Mean Girls at $83 million. Night Swims brought in $41 million worldwide, with Son of a Rich 2 and the Bremontown Musicians in fourth and fifth place. Fighter enters the chart at number six with $25 million worldwide, followed by Rob and Roll at number seven. At number eight from Japan, Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Freedom at $8.87 million this past weekend comes in eighth place on the chart, followed by Clex Academy at number nine and Alienoid Return to the Future from South Korea at number 10. The Book of Clarence and ISS drop off of this chart altogether. January is traditionally a very slow month at the box office, which means there's not a lot of interest this year or many years. So we're actually going to skip the box office flashback this week. I'll probably bring it back next week. And our slow 2024 continues. Argyle is the only notable wide release coming up this weekend. I will be seeing it and reviewing it here on the channel. But yeah, it is a pretty deadly dull couple months coming up here at the box office. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to everybody who called in on the Mint Mobile hotline. Be sure, as I said, to stay tuned right here. I've got my Sunday interview coming. There's also movie reviews, box office, and more. All that stuff that we do here on the channel. Thanks for spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.